Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Have You Thought of a Career in Medical Research? Uh, this is also forming the third part of our joint NDS and NDORMS um, Open Work Experience Programme. So welcome to all of you who might have been here for the other events this week. Um, we're delighted to have uh, three researchers with us here today. who are going to tell us a bit more about their uh, career path um, and their research that they're working on now. Uh, we have Jenny Kane, we have Angus Wan, and we have Anne Francis, um, and they will all be talking to us um, shortly. There are plenty of opportunities for you to ask questions. I'm going to start off with our first, our first speaker, who is Jenny Kane, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about how she got to what she's doing now and her path along the way. Jenny. Hi, everyone. And um, so I am working as a postdoctoral scientist at the University of Oxford. Um, and I'll tell you what that means um, through my journey as how I got there. Uh, so I started um, having an interest in science at school. I found biology the most challenging subject, but also the most interesting. It seemed like it was developing quickly and there was lots to learn. And so I studied it as a degree um, in Aberystwyth University. Um, I wasn't entirely sure what part of biology interested me most. Um, so I did a really broad degree of biological sciences, which meant I get, got to choose modules on biodiversity of birds and pathogens and lots and everything you can think of in biology, really. And through that, I discovered that I was most interested in human biology and understanding how people and their immune systems respond to different bacteria and viruses. Um, at the end of my degree, I did a project um, looking at lung cancer and trying to detect it early on and um, using a very specialised um, technology. Uh, and that led me to do a PhD, um, which to be honest, when I was finishing my degree, I didn't really know what a PhD was until one of my friends got the opportunity to do one. Um, and it's a very specialised um, research degree through a university, three or four years where you have a research question, something that no one's looked at before, and you try and answer it through reading the literature, so what, what people have done before in that area, and also designing experiments to be able to challenge um, new concepts that haven't really been investigated before. Uh, so my PhD um, I did at the University of Nottingham, and it was on lung disease again. Um, and it was looking for markers to detect disease early on. And I was lucky enough to be um, able to go and visit a company through that experience um, that were making lateral flow devices. At the time, no one really knew what a lateral flow device was, but now I'm sure everyone's very familiar with those. Um, but instead of um, using saliva um, and a, um, a throat or nasal brush that we do nowadays, and it was using urine, more like a pregnancy test, um, and also blood samples as well. Um, and so the line would come up if uh, someone had these markers that were more likely to be present in the person if they had a particular lung condition. Um, and then towards the end of my PhD, I wasn't entirely sure again what I was going to do. And so I looked at different job options. Um, I looked at some science companies around where I was living, um, but I also found a um, postdoctoral position at the University of Oxford. Um, and I enjoyed working in academia. Um, and so I thought that's a route I want to pursue, continuing the research that I was doing, but in a slightly different angle. Um, so the research I do now um, is looking at COPD, which is chronic obstructive lung disease, 
Um, and so that's when people have difficulty breathing and it's very common, especially in smokers. Um, and we're looking at why certain people um, respond to treatments and other people don't. And is that related to them having an underlying bacterial infection? And to do that, I get um, brushes from people that are having a bronchoscopy, which is like a, um, a tube going down someone's throat. And again, like the swabs that everyone's used to, um, is that's put down into the airways of people and cells are swept and collected from that. Um, I then take them to the lab and grow them in um, different uh, flasks. And I've designed a model where I can 3D culture them. So instead of them just being stuck to plastic, um, they differentiate and we have cilia, so the, the little hairs that beat and then um, push mucus up and out of the airways. You can see them on the cells. You can also see them producing a lot of mucus. Um, and this model much better represents the airway than previous models of the airway. Um, and this model has actually been really useful in more recent times um, for um, investigations into COVID and understanding how um, COVID actually the virus gets into cells and whether certain um, medicines are helpful against um, the virus entering the cells. Um, and so while the pandemic has been tough on everyone, it's been really interesting in the field of lung disease research. Um, and I think actually it's brought a lot of researchers together. I've been able to work with people that work with viruses that I wouldn't have done before. I've learned a lot through it, definitely. Um, a typical day for me um, would be checking my emails first thing. And then um, my, the cells that I grow um, eat a very particular um, diet and they need to be fed every other day. So I'll go and check on them and feed them. I might have some bacteria stocks growing that I need to tend to. Um, and if it's an infection day, then put that on the cells. Um, so I'll spend about half of my day, maybe a bit more in the lab. And the rest of the time I'm focused on writing papers. Um, so any output that you have um, of your scientific experiments um, it's ideal for the scientific world to know about. And so you can put that together and publish it in various different journals that you may have seen um, and can access on the internet. Um, what else is good about my job? Um, I do have a lot of flexibility, which is quite nice. Um, so I can choose what I do when. Um, and I think a bonus in non-pandemic times is being able to go to conferences and present research that we found um, in different places and to different people. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the end. Again, if you write them in the chat. Um, yep, yeah, that's me. Thank you very much, Jenny. That's that's great. I, I don't think we have we have a, a general question that's come in, but I'm going to leave that to the end. I think uh, because I think all of you might want to answer that. Um, but I'm intrigued, Jenny. So you said that your some of your research has switched because of COVID. Uh, what's happened to your original project? Are you, are you now focusing on COVID or can you combine them in some way? Um, I combine them. So it's, it's great that we have this cell culture model that means that we can test different things at the same time. And um, it's also a a group effort so there are students working on um on the projects as well so things aren't being left behind we're just doing extra things that we're interested in as well okay that's that's great um and um i suppose just out of interest what 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 um what subjects did you sort of really like at school did that affect your decision did it change when you were at university 
Um, so I, I've always kept my options very open and been as broad as possible. And the A-levels I did were um, chemistry, biology, maths, and further maths. So I suppose I started going down the scientific route then. Um, but no, I've just kind of gone with what I found interesting at the time and, and pursued that. And it seems to have worked out well so far. Seems quite sensible. Okay, so we're just gonna move on to our next speaker now. Um, again, don't forget that you can type any questions you have into the Q&A box. Um, so we're just going to move now on to Angus, who's going to tell us uh, a bit more about what he's been getting up to um, <laughs> in his life. Angus. In my life. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, so, yeah, my name's Angus Wan. I'm what's called a principal investigator now. At least that's what I'm supposed to call myself, although I still tell everyone I'm very much wearing my L plates. I'm still a learner at doing what I'm doing. And effectively, what I'm, what I'm learning is that means that I run my own research group within a university environment. So I've been offered the opportunity to now think about taking my own scientific ideas and uh, getting other people to think about designing experiments to test those. So this is uh, a wonderful opportunity, really, slightly terrifying opportunity, but to, to sort of look back, to reflect, to think, how on earth did I arrive here or, or get to this point in my career? And, and the truth is, and I'm sure this is true for a lot of people, that it's a real mixture of planned, strategic decision making, really thinking about things, really looking into them, researching them and talking to as many people as possible, but also pure chance, pure luck, happy serendipitous if you will lucky chance interactions with people or hearing the right thing at the right time just when you're in the right mood to be inspired by that that drove me down a particular path um so at school well at school i was sport crazy i was uh, fascinated by sport did almost every sport but also was particularly interested in sports and, and athletics and athletes in particular and i guess one of the, the reason one of the things i realized that i had a real passion for was the capacity of the human body to be pushed, to be pushed to its limits. And that made me interested in uh, sports people, but people going very high up mountains, people going very deep down in the sea and understanding how on earth the body had the capacity to deal with those different environments. And then increasingly just how the body worked, how on earth the cells and the tissues within this thing that we wander around in every day, uh, assemble themselves and do the incredible their job they do. So I guess I was, as Jennifer was saying, just fascinated with human biology and fascinated with the workings of the human bo body. But I, I had a choice to make. I had to decide whether I was going to try and mix my passions. So try to take sport and science and put those together. And at that time, there were degrees that I could have gone off to do in sports science. There were emerging degrees looking at the study of elite sports people and thinking about using science in those contexts but I actually decided to do something called physiology. And I'm very pleased I did. And physiology is a degree that's really broad based. It's in my case, it was entirely understanding the workings of the human body because you're just trying to discover, understand how cells, tissues, and all of our organs put together work as a system. And so I, I did physiology undergraduate degree at the University of Cardiff. And again, I met incredible inspiring scientists the whole way and I also came across bits of science within what I thought were interesting that just didn't switch me on at all that I thought were really boring I really wasn't just interested in at all um, so I knew though that all of the science that I was listening to all the science I really liked kept things together kept things as a system kept the things uh, complicated and in their physiological context and I learned to understand that I meant I was probably becoming a physiologist somebody who actually thinks that way and likes to apply that sort of thinking within their science and keep things as complicated as possible in their experiments. So what I suppose that means is that when I was looking with what to do next, and, and by the way, as, a, as a, a little aside here at this point, I really had no idea still when I finished my undergraduate degree if I wanted to be a scientist because I hadn't really operated as a scientist, I hadn't done that yet. So it wasn't until the very end of my third year in my degree that I got to do a project and I got to be in the lab amongst scientists doing experiments and really getting a feel for what that felt like. And I loved it. It was the best bit of my degree by a long way. So that meant I knew I wanted to be a scientist, wanted to be a laboratory scientist. I knew I loved the university environment. Um, I saw what Jennifer was talking about, the autonomy, the sort of freedom of these people apparently in their working environments to think about the ideas they had and to do experiments uh, to try to address those questions. 
but I needed uh, to wait because it was the very end of the degree scheme. So to do a PhD, to do this specialized postdoc, specialized training, uh, it, uh, called this PhD, that I'd have to wait and find, spend a year to find my right supervisor and find the right project that I wanted to do. So I, I took a year out, so to speak, went off into the real world. Uh, I believe or I understand I was working in something called finance for a little while. I know I was terrible at it. I know they thought I was terrible at it. And that was probably one of the most insightful times for me to realize that science was for me. That I was cursed and that's what I wanted to do. So I went off, I did my PhD at St. George's University of London, a hospital in the South London. I was doing physiology again. I was trying to understand how our knees work, how the how the, the fluid that's within our knees is lubricated and how that means our knees don't go crunch when we when we close them. I was uh, becoming increasingly interested in the musculoskeletal system, so our skeleton, our cartilage, our bones, how that all came together, how that developed and formed. And towards the end of my PhD, I was interested in how cells and tissues made decisions when they were being squashed and squeezed and pulled about by mechanical forces, by physical forces. And I found biology extremely complicated. The more you looked, the more there was that you realized you didn't understand. But if you also included physics into the mix, then things got really, really interested. So how on earth a cell could make a decision, a biological decision, using its genes, its instruction manual, when it was being squashed the whole time, became the thing I was particularly interested in. Now, Jennifer said something that helps a great deal. She was talking about motile cilia, the cilia within our airways. And that was the only type of cilium or cilia I'd ever heard of. Um, when I applied for a job, and this job was to study the primary cilium, which was something I'd never heard of at all. It wasn't in the textbooks as far as I was concerned. I'd never learned about it at school. So I had the opportunity to study something after my PhD as a postdoctoral researcher, which is to investigate what the primary cilium was, what it's made of, what it does, why on earth cells have it. And they only have one. It's very, very tiny. It's about one ten thousandth of the width of an eyelash. It's this tiny little organelle within cells or a compartment within cells. And we wanted to understand how cells used it to make decisions. And the reason I got into that was because some people had started to say that they thought cells had this to help them understand mechanical forces and how to integrate being squashed and squeezed the whole time with the biological behavior that they were, ex explore, that they were supposed to be conducting. So it, to me, this was incredible. This was a bit of a cell that no one knew what it did. And we could ask the most simple questions about which cells have them and when they have them and why and whether they mean anything in adulthood with respect to when you're young and whether they go wrong in diseases. A real basic science and discovery science, which I felt extremely lucky to be doing at the point in, in, in science that I was entering into. So I worked as a postdoc uh, looking at primary cilia in a department that did a lot of biology, but also a lot of engineering because we needed to squash things whilst we were looking at the biology. And that meant I became particularly interested again in how musculoskeletal tissues, how our skeleton might use cilia to make the right decisions downstream to mechanical forces, to physical forces. That got me into thinking about diseases, diseases like arthritis, when some of the tissues within our skeleton are damaged, potentially damaged by either the wrong kinds of responses to mechanical force or by too great mechanical forces. And so I one day turned up at a conference, as Jennifer said, in one of my favorite places, I gave a, a big talk, got really excited about my science, said cilia do everything. Don't you know, we need to explore cilia in all contexts. We should look at cilia and arthritis. Um, and one of the members of the audience was somebody who worked at an institute particularly focused on arthritis, the Kennedy Institute at the University of Oxford. She took me aside and after about having her ear bashed off for about 30 minutes about cilia do everything and et cetera, et cetera, she said, well, you must come and give a seminar at the University of Oxford, which I did. I came and bashed the ears of another hundred people at the University of Oxford in, in, a, in a seminar at the Kennedy Institute. And lo and behold, I very luckily they said, well, would you like to come to the end of Kennedy Institute and set up your own laboratory? and think about training your own students and thinking about having your own postdocs within the lab. And why don't you tell us whether cilia really mean anything or are important for how cells make decisions or make the wrong decisions in arthritis. So that's what I started doing in 2015. And so incredibly, it's an incredible journey for me because when you're doing your PhD, you produce one of these, this is your thesis, your big great work that basically defines what you've been doing for all of those years. And I'm, I'm really proud because this is one of the things I really enjoyed doing is that this is my first PhD project student's thesis. So she's submitted that and has gone off to think about her own ideas and gone off to America to do some science over there. Um, and so 
that's the journey I've been on. Uh, it means I'm no longer in the lab anymore. So my normal day, unfortunately, is, is well, at the moment it's in this room, but it's very much more looking at the computer screen, writing, typing, I should say, much more than holding a pipette or doing anything in the laboratory anymore, which I'm a little bit sad about. But the really exciting thing is I still am talking to people about their ideas, their science, and I have students and postdocs who are working in my lab who are saying, well, you know that idea we had Well, I did that experiment, here's what I found, either blaming me for it or feeling very happy about the result they've got, because we're in a really privileged position. If you're a discovery scientist like myself, it means that every once in a while, either myself or one of my students or one of the postdocs within my lab is the first person to see something or find out something and no one else in the world at that point knows that and that's an incredibly privileged position that I think probably still is the thing that that fuels me staying in science the whole time and that's what I love so much about my job still so that's something a little bit of the journey that I've been on if you will Natalie um, and I'm sure there's plenty of questions about, about that on the way happy to take those Okay, uh, we haven't we haven't got any questions yet, but please do type them. There will be plenty of time at the end for me to ask Angus or Jenny um, a bit more about their research or just more generally about their career. Um, so um, I suppose thinking about uh, what you said, Angus, um, I, I think I'm picking it up a bit that you regret slightly being out of the lab now, um, but. On the whole, are you are you happy, or you want to? Is it that thing like where in in just management you move up and you you get further and further away from the job that you originally loved, or or is there enough there for you? Yeah, perhaps. I mean, it's probably fair to say I'm I'm still transitioning a little bit from being in the laboratory to not being in the laboratory, and and probably this year, this strange eighteen months that we've just had, been a bit of an extreme version of that in the sense that if I were still around the lab as much as I'd like to be, then I'd be by their side, probably bothering them quite a lot and still having a play with things in the lab. I think, I think it's, um, it's something I'm getting to grips with. You know, I, I still feel very connected to my science, got a very small group. So it still means we're still pouring over the, the raw data and trying to work things out. And hopefully every once in a while, I still am useful coming into the lab, but you're right. There's, there's no doubt that I miss being the person actually doing the experiment. That said, that's a really tough part of the business. You know, the vast majority of the disappointments that science will throw you away when you're trying to do something that's really tough, when you're trying to see something for the first time or understand something for the first time, most of the time things aren't working. So I, I, I guess I probably also avoid a lot of the heartache and the despair that comes from being in the lab, being the person doing the experiment. And I'm just the slightly annoying person who only really wants to know when we've got an answer or, or or when, whether an experiment's given us a result or not. So yes, I miss it, uh, but I also recognize that in some ways I'm removing myself from some of the very hardest parts of it. Um, and I, I guess that autonomy I had, I've got even more of now. So once upon a time, I may have been a researcher who would have sort of said, I, you know what, I don't know. I, I, think, I think this is the question we should ask. And increasingly from becoming a PhD student to becoming a postdoc, you know, increasingly you're trusted more and more. Well, that's a good question. You know, absolutely go off and do that. You know, now, terrifyingly, um, I'm the person that would come up with the ideas or think of what the questions are. And of course, that's that's incredibly freeing. You know, I'm ultimately kind of in charge to a certain extent of what we do next. Um, but it, some responsibility and admin comes with it. I'd be lying if, if I didn't. Know. OK. Uh Thank you very much. Uh, so we're just going to move on to our final speaker now, who is Anne, um, and she's going to tell us a bit more about her work and her career. Anne. Thank you, Natalie. Hello, everyone. Um, as Natalie said, my name's Anne, and I'm going to tell you a bit about my career, um, which is starts similarly to the stories that you've heard from Jenny and Angus, but has quite a different, uh, takes a different turn, um, and I would describe it as science outside of the lab. So similarly to Jenny and Angus at school, I really enjoyed science, um, particularly biology, and I had a feeling that that was where the future lay for me. I chose to do biology and chemistry and maths at A-level, um, and out of those, biology was definitely my favourite. Um, but what I knew quite early on whilst doing my LE levels was, was that the thing that really fascinated me what was, was what was going on in the cells. 
of the body or the plant, not, not anything more sort of bigger scale than that. So I decided that I wanted to go and do um, biochemistry at genetic, uh, biochemistry at university. Um, I went to the University of Leeds and I actually ended up doing a degree in biochemistry and genetics as once I started my degree I realised that whilst biochemistry was interesting it was actually genetics and molecular biology that I really um, really enjoyed and that sort of fascinated me and at the end of my first year I was able to transfer from just a straight, gen um, straight biochemistry to a biochemistry and genetics degree. Um, I really enjoyed my degree course and as I came to the end of that decided that uh, like Jenny and Angus wanted to stay on um, and studying and do one of these PhDs. Um, that's when I came here to Oxford. I was offered a place in the Department of Plant Sciences to do a PhD and that was um, investigating how the growth of leaves in plants and how that was controlled by the genes within the plants themselves. However, when I got to the latter stages of my PhD, I really knew that I was not staying in the lab. <laughs> it was not the career path for me. Um, but I really wanted to stay in science. I wanted to use the knowledge I'd gained during my undergraduate degree, during my PhD, um, and, and use that in a, in a sort of scientific area. Um, much to my then boyfriend and now husband's disappointment, I really, really didn't want to go off and work in finance in the city and earn loads of money. Um, so I also knew that planning and organising things were stuff I was good at and thought that that would be a sensible thing to incorporate into whatever I decided to do. I was really lucky once I finished my PhD I was able to take a few months off. I worked part time for a friend as a nanny and that just gave me a bit of time to think about what I really did want to do and re research a few options. For a while I considered going into publishing because that's what quite a lot of other people who left the lab did but I clearly quite quickly became clear to me that that was not not the career path for me. Uh, writing not being my absolute strength which for publishing <laughs> is probably not a great uh, combination but during this time I discovered about clinical research. So clinical research which is the area in which I now work is the area that develops new treatments and knowledge to improve, to improve human health um, by generating evidence that the new treatments or approaches to treatment are safe and effective. And this is done by, by assessing these treatments or approaches in clinical trials. I'm guessing that due to the last 18 months that we've all had to endure, most of you have hopefully now heard about clinical trials because they've become something that's been frequently in the news headlines and more and more talked about in daily life, given all the research into treatments for COVID-19 that has taken place around the world, in the UK and here in Oxford. Hopefully some of you will have heard about the recovery trial that's been run by the University of Oxford and identified dexamethasone as a treatment for COVID, as well as all the trials that have been run um, through the university to develop the, um, the COVID vaccine. But in case not, in case anyone's yeah, not heard, just to explain. So typically in a clinical trial, we are comparing a possible new treatment, one that's been developed by scientists based on maybe what's going on in, in the cells themselves or in the, in, the, in the body of patients with a certain condition. And we're comparing that usually to either the current treatment that's given or sometimes for condition, there is conditions where there is no treatment. So we compare it to nothing or what's called a placebo or dummy treatment. People who agree to join the trial are allocated to one of those treatments, either the new treatment that we're testing or the current best treatment or placebo, and we collect data from them, on them, about their health, before, during and after the trial, the treatment. And then the data from those two groups of people is compared by our statisticians to see if there's a difference in how people have done, have people on one treatment got better or not got worse or whatever we're looking at, quicker or better. Um, and through that analysis of the data that's collected, we can work out if the new treatment is better or not. However, when I was looking to get into clinical trials and get my first job, what was really apparent that was nearly every job advert was expecting you to have experience. So I needed to find a job that would be that first, first foot in the door and give me the experience I needed. I was lucky and um, my first job came up as a in the position of what was called a clinical trial support officer and this didn't require me to have any previous experience and that was here within the university within a group running cancer trials. The first trial I worked on was a big trial called the VICT trial and it was investigating if a drug could help prevent colorectal cancer coming 
from coming back. The main part of this job was to enter data that the hospital staff collected on the people who joined the trial and enter that from paper forms into a database. However, it wasn't just a case of entering what was written, we needed to just think about what was being entered, make sure the data made sense and assess it. And if not, check, check with the hospital staff that the data was correct. Accuracy was also very important as obviously if we entered something wrong into the database, that data would then be what was analysed by the statisticians, so it was really important that it was accurate. The experience of having gone through my PhD helped me understand how everything within these big clinical trials fitted together and made it to me how come out how important what was then quite a repetitive job actually was in, in the greater scheme of things. Um, I had some really great colleagues and I was able to learn a lot in that first job. And after 11 months, I was able to move up the ladder and took a job within the same group as a clinical trial administrator, again for another trial um, of a treatment for colorectal cancer. This job was a bit more senior, so I had a bit more responsibility and I was responsible for working with all the hospitals that were going to run the trial to get them ready, get, make sure they had all the documents in place, they knew what needed to be done, um, and also to it was my responsibility to make sure that they had drugs available so that when they had patients who agreed to come and join the trial that they could have their treatment. This is when the being organised skills came in <laughs> to the fore and also um, I realised that you needed to be really good at communicating because I was talking to lots of different people on a daily basis because clinical trials involve lots of different people. Obviously there are the patients who agree to take part and there's the medical staff who look after them, doctors, nurses, sometimes other healthcare professions. And then there's also the team within which I was working, people who organise the clinical trial and make it happen. And we'd have scientists and doctors who were involved in usually whose ideas the trial were. And we had the statisticians and often we work with drug companies who'd be providing the drugs. So there was lots of different people um, to, to talk to. Sometime later, um, a more senior role came along, and this was more akin to the level that I would have worked on if I'd have gone on and done one of these postdoctoral positions. Um, the role was somewhat different to what I'd been doing so far, um, but um, was still part of the wider team running the clinical trials. So the job um, I took was called a clinical trial monitor and it involved going out to visit the hospitals running the trials to check that they were carrying out the trials correctly and that the data they were filing to us was accurate. I typically was visiting various hospitals around the UK um, two to three days a week and working from home on the other and just going into the into the central office in Oxford once a fortnight. Again accuracy and an eye for detail were very keen skills as well as um, important skills, sorry, as well as um, good communication again. Unfortunately, I didn't really enjoy this role as much as others. I think I missed being surrounded by my colleagues and the work wasn't so varied. So when an opportunity arose to go back into an office-based job within the same group, I took up the role of trial manager. So in this role, I was responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the trials, up to four at any one time. And it included um, responsibility for more junior members of staff, such as those in the roles where I had started. <clears throat> in this role, um, the work I was carrying out was really varied, and I think that's one of the things that I really enjoyed. I might be writing documents, setting up procedures, testing databases, joining meetings to update senior staff and collaborators about progress, or trying to sort out problems as they arose. There was always plenty to do. It's a busy job. Um, so prioritising and planning were important and I did find myself do, doing and still to this day doing a surprisingly large amount of maths. Um, I carried on in this role working on various projects for about nine years with each project bringing new challenges and new things to learn. But having gained about 10 years experience and as one of the trials I looked after came to the end it felt time to move on. I'd learnt locks working in cancer trials but it was time to do something different. When I say move on though, I didn't really move very far because <laughs> a job came up, uh, a more senior job as a senior trial manager came up um, at the Kennedy Institute, which is where Angus works. And this happened to be the building next door to where I'd spent the last 10 years. 
In this role, I still had day-to-day -day responsibility for a clinical trial. Um, this one was called the RID trial, and it was investigating um, the treatment for a hand condition called Dupuytren's disease. And I managed a small, a small team of staff. But what was new to me in this role was that I had the opportunity to be involved in the development of new trials. So the majority of the trials we run here at the university are funded by research grants to carry out the projects. These grants have to be applied for and we have to give a detailed explanation of what we want to do, why we want to do it, how we're going to do it and how much it will cost. So my experience that I'd gained over the last 10 years was really useful in terms of how we're going to do it and how much it's going to cost. I stayed in that role for about two and a half years <coughs> um, until another job was advertised within the department, which had a slightly wider remit working within a, a larger team, many of whom I'd known well, or I know well, having worked with them over a number of years. Um, and something that I now realise is really important to me as being working within a, within a team. I also felt this new opportunity had um, new job had opportunity to learn and share more, my, more of my experience and after much indecision I decided to apply and then was appointed to my current job within Endorms which is um, as clinical trial operational lead for experimental medicine and rheumatology which is a really long job title. So in my current role I oversee the clinical trial managers and other staff who are running clinical trials on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm their go-to person for questions they have about what they're doing I oversee their projects to make sure things are progressing in the right direction. I also spend a considerable amount of time dealing with staff management, so recruiting new staff as new projects come along or as people move on, providing training um, and making sure that the staff that we have in post are, are supported. And again, I'm still involved with, with new projects and grant applications as they come through. The work I do in this role is really wide ranging and really varied, and this is something I really enjoy. Um, a typical day for me is very much at the computer. Um, I haven't been back to the building um, since it was closed at the beginning of the pandemic uh, and have worked really successfully from home. I am um, on the computer all day, spend quite a lot of time in meetings with the different teams running the different projects write a lot of emails, reply to a lot of emails, um, and occasionally somewhere along the line do some, write some, create some documents and, and review lots of documents from other people. Um, I'm really grateful and lucky to work with some really great people in my team and in the wider uh, group with which I work. So I think what I would really like to say is if you like biological sciences, don't mind maths, um, have a good eye for detail and think that organising and planning stuff is okay. Don't think that um, lab science is the only science. There are many areas, including clinical research, for which uh, uh, studying science, particularly biology, would be really helpful. I do have colleagues who work in this area who don't have a kind of science or haven't studied biology, maybe at A-level or at, at university. Um, but I think it's really helpful because it helps me understand why the trials are being done, why the data is being collected, and I'm sure it's meant I've progressed in my career more quickly. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Uh, thank you very much, Anne. Um, I've got a quick question for you before we kind of open it up to everybody. Um, so your very first job in clinical trials was um, data entry and you were saying you were taking all the stuff from paper forms. Has that changed at all recently? Are you getting more data collection through, I don't know, smart devices or mobile phones or apps and things like that? Yeah, so one thing that's really changed since I, I started working in clinical trials, which was now nearly 15 years ago, is we try as much as possible for everything to be electronic and it's one of the reasons that I haven't had to go into an, into into work and just work from home throughout the pandemic is that we do everything as much electronically. So all the data that we collect from patients tends to be entered either by the patients directly into our database or by the hospital staff directly. So actually now we don't have many of those roles of people just doing debt coming in and starting doing data entry. Um, yeah, so that's something that really has changed. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Anne. OK, so I'm now going to um, I've got some questions that are a bit a bit broader. Um, so I, I guess one that's pertinent to this week in particular, as, as this is part of the uh, Work Experience Open programme, is um, how important is work experience? And I think we could just say generally trying out jobs as well as work experience, because I, I guess um, I would include that as well. So I guess trying something out before you do it properly, it, it more broadly. Um, Jenny, do you want to start there? Yep. Um, so I I got experience in the lab um, through my degree. I didn't have any lab experience before that, um, but I did have experience in other things which are useful for working in a laboratory setting. Uh, I did a lot of volunteering and had a lot of um, teamwork experience. Um, and and responsibility on different levels and being able to manage things on a different level <laughs> um, rather than in the lab. Um, so for, for me, it wasn't so important to get into my career position to have work experience, but more enthusiasm and interest and show that you have read around the the area that you're interested in and yeah you do show enthusiasm I um when I had my interview for my PhD I was asked about my baking that I'd put on my CV um and actually that is a really good um way to show that you can follow a recipe or follow a method and then do something correctly um and I also had um I do a lot of running um, and I've run marathons and I put that on my CV as well. And that showed that I've got persistence. So when things go wrong, when you have an injury, you can continue going the same for in the lab. So while I think it's important to have experience in things to know that it's something you want to go into, there are ways around it, particularly in, in the current times. Um, to show that you're enthusiastic and you have the skills to, to do what you want to do. Angus, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think James is right. I think there's two points out there. There's your CV, so you can demonstrate how much you care that you've taken the time to go out to find these opportunities. But there's probably the more important one, and I think this is what Jennifer was saying, was to just understand what on earth that role looks like and how you think you'll enjoy it. You know, there's a lot to be said for seeing it actually in action happen around you and for talking to those people and for understanding and for seeing them in action in the highs and the lows to really understand what that job's all about. So I think it's probably, mo it's probably more important for discovering what you want to do than for getting you in the door in the first place. Yeah, and as you said earlier, Angus, it, it can actually be just as valuable to find out something you really dislike. Um, so, um, you know, you could waste a lot of time going into a job where, if you get a chance to try it out first, it may be that you think, no, this really just isn't for me. And the sooner you find that out, probably the better, I guess. Um, and I think you sort of, you you actually sought out a more junior role by the sounds of it um, to get that experience. Um, do you want to add anything more to that? Yeah, I mean, I did. And I specifically had to take quite, compared to where I could have gone, quite, quite a junior role um, to get that experience. Um, the only other thing I was going to to add is also like because I <laughs> spend quite a bit of time looking at people's CVs when they apply for jobs is just just to kind of reiterate that you know you don't have to have done a certain have got experience in the work setting like if you're involved in a you know you can get experience of going to meetings and maybe taking minutes or being the treasurer of, of a club or society or, or something that you're interested in or through some kind of voluntary work um, and, and, you know, we very often, I often see that on people's CVs and, you know, that's as, as valuable. It's, it's often very much the same process that, that we would maybe expect someone to do in a role. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't mean you, you don't necessarily need to have had a job. Excellent. Thank you. That's a, a good advice there. Um, if you can prove you have the skills some other way, that's always a possibility. If you're thinking about getting work experience specifically to uh get a job or, or to get a place at university rather than just to find out a bit more about whether you enjoy it or not um i guess we've got a question for all of you um we may as well start with Anne since uh, you just answered um what was the most fulfilling moment in your career 
<laughs> um, that's a really good question. <sighs> I mean, I, actually finishing my PhD, there was times and I, I don't know if Jenny and Angus might nod where it feels like it's never going to come to the end. <laughs> So being able to, I also have one of those books like Angus just showed, um, mine is actually holding up my laptop computer, so <laughs> it's come to great use. Um, completing that was great, but also, you know, um, when we can, you know, when some of the, the trials I've been involved with, we've, we've kind of got to the end, uh, or nearly the end, what, what everybody else seems is the end, as in we've got some results and we can, those are being shared that that's a really exciting moment and um, especially if it's a very exciting result. Angus, how about you? Yeah, I had a feeling this might always be the case because when people used to talk um, in the more latter years of their careers, they would, they would always tell you the journey through science, through the people that they'd worked alongside and maybe the people that came out of their groups or that they had a little bit of formative time with before they went off and did something great. And so, there's no question that whilst I agree, Anne, that that book and finally finishing that book and being able to put that book away, preferably underneath something, was was a great moment for me. It was it was someone else's book. It was some of the students coming out of my lab and seeing them present their work and then produce that giant book and go off and do great things. That's far and away been the most fulfilling thing, actually, because you sort of you're just very proud of, of them and what, what they're going off to do next. And you think that will probably, you know, that will have some some real impact, hopefully, because they're going to go off and you think excitedly about all the exciting things they're going to do next. Okay, uh, Jenny, how about you? Um, uh, an extra thing I would add is a lot of um, time, I think, is spent trying to apply for money to do more experiments and be able to find more things. And so when you have a, a grant application accepted, um, it just feels like finally people do believe in what you're researching and that it is interesting. Um, so that, that's also been a, a very positive experience for me. Okay, while you're there, Jenny, our, our next question is then, what's the most interesting thing that you've learned from your research? Um, Lots of, lots of little scientific discoveries, but I think mainly just how, how vast everything in science is and how as soon as you discover something, it opens up 20, 200 more questions. And so you end up exploring more and more and more into why certain things happen. Um, and so, yeah, the... Ability to, to always learn something new. I think it's it's never the same thing again and again. You're always following the path and and continuing on that. Uh, and you want to if there's anything in particular? I mean, either I guess you directly or your trials that you've worked on. Yeah, it's another really good question. Um, most interesting thing I, I honestly think that probably the thing that's most interesting is that you never quite know what's around the corner both in kind of the work you do like, and maybe where your career is going I, I never massively planned I, I definitely wanted to go into clinical research but I didn't really have any kind of strong plan as to where that would take me um, so yeah I just never quite know what's around the corner and, and what's going to happen next. Okay, Angus. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right, the unknown. So some of the funny thing about people who like discovering things or exploring things is there's nothing more exciting than realising there's even more to explore and even more to discover. And so quite often it is that sort of, wow, goodness, well, that raises this question and, and that idea. That's that sort of is the most interesting part. You, you, and you very, very rarely actually have the answer. There is no point at which, but that, there we go then. That's what that does. We know everything we need to know about that. Let's move on now. So uh, and I think, um, yeah, that's what's constantly fascinating, right? Is that there's so much more out there to, to discover. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Angus. Did you ever uh, discover uh, anything very specific at the about the primary psyllium that that was new to anyone or? Yeah, so I, I, maybe I think so. Some people have told me so at least. So we we were actually exploring whether changing the environment that those cells were living in, making it stiffer or harder or softer, how that changed their behaviour. When we very accidentally discovered that something um, that we associate with another process within the body, inflammation, made cilia get longer. And um, it was definitely a moment one afternoon where I had to go on Google and sort of Google a couple of words and say, has anyone ever associated the word cilia and the word inflammation together before? And, and there was nothing out there. And you sort of think, wow, well, that's that's kind of cool. That's pretty exciting. That could mean something. So, um, and that's, that's, substantive. that's largely one of the reasons that I was given my own lab is to sort of explore what on earth that meant and whether that was meaningful information. So that was a fun moment. Yeah. That's one of those good times where you, you come out and you think, Hey, that was worth it. Okay. Well, that leads quite nicely into my next question, I guess. Um, so you said those were good times, um, but I have had a question here about how do you motivate or convince yourself to do research? And I, I guess, I mean, there must be an element of research where things aren't always going swimmingly. So if things are getting a bit tough, how, how, how do you motivate yourself to keep going? I, I don't know if you want to pick that one up, Angus, and then I'll ask the others. Yeah, so there's no question that one of the, the big challenges that comes from doing tricky things is tricky things going wrong or people saying, I don't think you should do that tricky thing because I don't really see what's the, the value in you doing that. And that comes in a number of different ways. So for me, that quite often is, as, as I think Jennifer was saying, I have to apply for money. I have to justify why we might do something for the next three or five years, say why it's important. And we'll constantly have people say it's, it's not that important. Someone else said something much more important. We're not going to give you that money. And indeed, it's the same when we write our papers about our science. So you're quite often getting what are rejections, people saying that that science isn't quite as interesting as you think it is, or we don't think that science is necessarily exactly saying what you think it is. And perhaps you could show it to somebody else. And so there is quite often a lot of no's, a lot of rejection in science, I think. And, and certainly at the bench, it seems very often that biology rejects you itself. It decides to, to give you an answer that's not at all possible or for something to not work. So there are, there are, there are definitely lots of lows. There are lots of things where you have to, you know, shake yourself down and I guess basically not take it too personally. At least that's what I'm told. That's something I've still not managed to do, but you know, not take it too personally, not, not think the biology is out to get you particularly just that this is part of the process and that this is what we have to do. And I think normally that's where context and others, or maybe even the past is, is pretty useful, but you've really just got to get some context. You really just got to realize that some of the greatest things that you may have looked at or realized were, were incredible findings or some of the great careers that people have been through were not without those same challenges. You know, actually it took them a hundred years maybe to get to that point in terms of their science. And, and many people will definitely, when they talk about their careers, will, will, will hopefully increasingly at least be pretty honest about saying, you know, that, that whole period of time we accomplished ostensibly nothing at all on paper, you know. And I, I think, so that's, if that's a form of motivation, you know, at least to, to get context, to talk to other people about it and make, and they will make you realize that it was the same for them, but they'll, very often, and it's your colleagues and the group within which you're, you're closest to, not the people that are reviewing your grants or telling you whether ideas are any good, that will come to you and say, hey, no, it's still a great idea. Don't you remember, you know, three months ago, or six months ago with that experiment? That, we were all really excited about that. You know, remember that feeling again and go forward with that. Um, I'm very lucky because I quite often have my students or the other people in the lab to help motivate me. And even if I'm sort of starting to waver and think, I don't know, you know, is this really the right way to go? You know, usually at least one or two of them are still excited. It's still pretty fired up about doing it. So I think people, other people around you and surrounding yourself by, with those enthusing people is very important to help motivate you because it can be very lonely otherwise. Uh, Anne, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Okay, uh, how about you, Jenny? Um, so I guess you're closer to your PhD and things like that. So how are you finding it, motivating yourself? Um, there, like Angus has said, there's definitely a lot of 
setbacks and the lot. Things don't always work right first time or 10th time or however many times until finally it does. So that itself, I think, is motivation when you finally get something to work. You know you've tried all these different combinations of things and there is a combination that works. Um, finally getting that and knowing that that's around the corner is uh, a motivation in itself. Also having good colleagues and um, people that you can go to a, a cafe or a pub to um, after work and just kind of talk through things and um, get some perspective about there have been good things and achievements you've done in, in the last week, however long. Um, but it's just that setback that is frustrating. I know some people have set themselves a time limit so they they will be angry about something for 24 hours and then accept that that's that move on try again um so that's something i try and stick to it's difficult though. <laughs> i love that idea of just going right i'm going to be angry for 24 hours and i'm not going to be angry i, I would love to have that much control over my patience um we have now um come up to the end of the hour. Um, I'd just like to thank all our speakers for coming here this afternoon to talk to us. It's been great to hear from you all um, and all the very different sort of uh, areas of science that you cover. Um, we are back again tomorrow with another one of these. So again, part of the Open Work Experience Programme and um, the Have You Thought of a Career in uh, Medical Research strand. So we have uh, three more um, different um, scientific researchers who'd be talking about their varied careers. Um, I would just uh, like to thank you, the audience, for coming along and for asking some great questions. Um, I think we managed to get to most of them, but there are still a couple left unanswered. Um, I may pass those on to some of you later. Um, but uh, thanks again for coming along, uh, and we hope to see at least some of you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>